Hello? Hello, Eddie? Yes, me. Yes, sir. This is uh, Izzy from MMA Jam Live. How you doing this evening? What's going on, brother? Feeling good? Can't complain? I hear you, bro. Thank, uh, thanks for taking the time on a Friday to chat with us here for a few minutes. I appreciate it. Come on, man. Anything for MMA Jam. You already know that already. Come on. Oh, okay. It's like that. All right. I appreciate that then. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just letting you know right now, Jay said that you're going to get the best interview, so the pressure's on you. Oh, damn. That's, that's, I don't know if that's good or horrible, man. <laughs> <laughs> he threw you out there, so I'm ready for it. All right, let's, let's, let's see if I can live up to this, <laughs> this hype. Um, <laughs> now, you, you've been fighting professionally for about three years now. Uh, what was the inspiration behind the decision to begin training in MMA? Oh, man, it was, it, was, it was actually weird, man. It wasn't like I, I watched UFC and, like, dreamt about being in the cage. That was, like, the farthest thing from the truth. I actually went to um, UFC 101, and when I walked into the arena, man, you know, we had pretty good seats from inside, watching all the fights, and I was like, damn, man, the adrenaline rush I got just from people screaming and yelling. I was like, I got to check this out, man. I want to try this, this sport out. I used to wrestle, so I'm like, why not? I think I could be good at this. Started doing some research, ran to Chris Weidman, who I wrestled in high school with, and he took me under his wing, and I started to pursue, you know, the dream of being in the UFC. Man, that that story, although we hear it a lot, like, it never happens that way. Like, I can't imagine a better scenario than running into a guy like Chris Weidman and just training under him and, you know, Matt Serra. Like, that just, things happen perfectly for you, it seems. Oh, man, without a doubt, man, it was like a blessing here in disguise. Like, you know, some people think that, oh, maybe you could have started early and younger, but I feel like, you know, you could you could almost get grinded out with the grind of fighting because it definitely is not easy physically but mentally as well. So I think everything happens, you know, perfectly. Now, now you, moved, you moved to New York, actually, from Jamaica as a child, right? Yeah, I came here when I was young, man, like, I came here when I was uh, three years old. My parents were both immigrants. They wanted us to get, you know, a better opportunity, more, you know, more chances to succeed in life. So we came here when I was uh, three. Now, now I know you, you know, you were very young, but how was it growing up having to adapt to a different culture? Oh, um, you know, being young, it, it helped me out. You know, my brothers and sisters are a little bit older, uh, so I was a little bit harder on them than it was for me. But um, it was tough at first. You know, being kids, kids always yell at each other and make fun of each other. So for me, when I was coming from another country, you know, having a little accent, you know, kids were kind of tough on me. But whatever, you know, maybe get thicker skin, maybe a person I am today, you know. Now, now we're talking about this is the, the I, if I'm not mistaken, this is about late, the mid to late 80s. Uh, how was it? Yeah, yeah, I was, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like I, I came around the eighty-seven, like eight, yeah, eighty-seven, eighty-eight. I came to the, the, the states. Now, how so was I, it? Believe it or not, man, I, I had a heavy accent, man. I had a heavy Jamaican accent. My mom actually put me in speech class because I always told her I wanted to be a businessman. So while all the other kids in my school was going to enrichment and learning how to play golf and bingo and this and all types of other crazy games. I was in a room locked up with a speech therapist, so it worked out, you know. You know, it, it's funny because if this is the first, like, let's okay, this is obviously the first time I'm talking to you, in, you know, on the phone, but I've heard you on Tuff. Now, if, if if I'm listening to you for the first time, I, I'm thinking, hey, you don't even have an accent. In fact, you definitely sound like you're from New York, and I know this because that's exactly where I'm from, so I, you <laughs> have that New York accent. Yeah, man, I, I, people say it all the time, you know, only time my accent really comes out is when I'm, you know, at home with my family or speaking to my mother, because she has a heavy, thick, you know, Jamaican accent, um, and my dad and, everybody, you know, my brother and sister, because they were, you know, a little bit older, I'm the youngest, so uh, they were older when they came here, so it was a lot harder uh, to shape their accent than, than myself, but, um, yeah, it just comes out, man. <laughs> Now, how was it during your school years? Was it something that it was hard to adjust? I mean, how were the other the, the other children? Did they treat you differently, or how was that whole experience? Yeah, the first the first couple of years, you know, were, were hard because you know really didn't have any friends, they didn't know anybody, and kids are kids, man, they're brutal. You know, they 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 pick on you because you're different because that's just what 
they're used to. My mom used to friggin' dress me to go to school. So coming from the islands, it could be fall outside in her mind. That's like winter time. So I'm stuck in like a <laughs> a, a colorful sweater <laughs> while all the kids are in t-shirts and they're like, "What in the world?" I have pictures my cousin has of literally we're at the park. Everybody's eating like fruits and vegetables and stuff. I'm sitting here in this sweater while everybody's in a t-shirt. I look at the odd man out. <laughs> So oh, it was tough. it was tough, but you know what? Everything to me happens for a reason in life, and it just made me the, the type of person I am today. Like words, literally, you know, I could, you know, I could can't, you know, care less if somebody wants to talk trash because I've been through it all as a kid, and maybe that was tougher, you know. Now, now I understand you had a, a football, a fo- excuse me, football and academic scholarship to Fordham, Fordham University, a university that I've seen on numerous occasions. Uh, were you ever close to seeking out a pro football career? Yeah, man, that was my first passion, my first dream. Um, I had opportunities to go to go to college to wrestle, but you know, from 11th grade on in high school, I knew that I wanted to pursue a football career. You know, I was lucky enough to get a you know full ride to a great school. Um, and, but in my mind, I always kept in the back of my head, "What if?" Because you know, not many people get a chance to play in the pros. So I wanted to go to a good academic, you know, school where I could have the opportunity if I did play football to succeed, you know, in the business world. But I could – it was priceless, man. I had literally the best coaches, you know, the best teammates ever at Fordham and opened up a lot of doors for me. I pursued the NFL career. Um, it didn't work out. They wanted me to – a couple of scouts wanted me to go to our uh, center practice squad, go to, you know, Canada, the CFL. But for me, it was like all or nothing, man. I don't want to ever – play on the, uh, you know, like a lesser lesser league. It's like NFL or nothing for me. And that's the same attitude I took with mixed martial arts, man. I knew that USC was the NFL of the mixed martial arts world. So that was like my number one goal, you know, from day one. I knew it wasn't going to be easy because, you know, there's guys that sit there and train four, five, six, ten years before they even get a shot. So I just said I'm just going to work as hard as I can and let the chips fall where they may. That's definitely a great attitude to have. Now, the the Fordham University, correct me if I'm wrong, they're, they're the, the Rams, correct? Yes, the Fordham Rams. Man. I'm, I'm a Ram, a Red Devil and a Ram. So it worked out for me on this season. It's tough. <laughs> it worked out. <laughs> my high school was red. You know, Fordham is pretty much the shade of red, maroon, and I was on a red team. So everything, um, it was all like a full circle. Damn, per- picture perfect. No kidding. Yes. Um, now... <laughs> You you double majored in finance and marketing and communication, and you're also a dad. You have a full time job, or did or are you still there? Or at the yeah, job? still yep, got a full time job. Okay, and and you're a fighter now. How easy or difficult is it to find a proper balance in your life? It's tough, man. It's um, it's not the ideal situation, but you know, for for me, it works. You know, I'm used to having a regular schedule and. I'm used to, you know, time management because when you have kids, your world changes. Like, it's no longer just about you. <laughs> you got a couple of them out to be. You got to balance, you know, their school and everything. But for me, the way I look at it is like a controlled, you know, chaos for me, man. Like, I literally work, take care of the kids, train. And for me, it's normal at this point. You know, at first it was tough. It was hard. But now I can see, you know, doing it no other way. Don't get me wrong. I wouldn't mind having a huge UFC deal where I could focus more on training because I don't want anybody to have any type of unfair advantage. Versus. I want to be able to, you know, like I said, go 150 you know, miles per hour with this thing because the window of opportunity is so, so short. You're young, but for so long, and you just got to make the best of it. It's interesting you brought that up because we had an Invicta fighter, Tanya Everger, come on saying that she isn't able to train 100% because of the lack of opportunities. So, therefore, I mean, she's not really fighting at her full potential. Is that something, I mean, obviously that's something you're trying to avoid. Exactly. Yeah, no, I, and I, I, I couldn't agree with her, you know, anymore. Like, people think that, you know, just because you're fighting, you're rich right away, but that's the farthest thing from the truth because, you know, there's a lot that goes into it. You know, you got training camps. You got, you can get training partners to come out. You got, it's, it's a lot. It's, it's a lot. It's expensive. And if you don't have the income to back that, you know, you're not going to be able to get the best training in the world. I'm fortunate enough where I got world-class guys that are training at my gym, so I don't have to travel as far. I don't have to pay guys to come in. 
things like that. But in that same case, you know, you got to put the time in. If you don't have 10, 15 hours a day to be training and you got to mix it up, you know, a couple hours here, a couple hours there, you know, go to work, come back half tired and uh, take care of the kids, bring the kids to the gym, have to worry about them distracting you. It's a lot, you know. But like I said, I'm not a big fan of excuses. So I just make the best of whatever I got and then, uh, and then just make it work for me, you know. Now, now you've pretty much have half the equation down, the whole training thing. You know, you mentioned you train with Sarah Longo, the Sarah Longo fight team. Uh, how has training with such a great team impacted your life professionally? Oh, it's been priceless, man. Literally, I was fortunate enough to, to, to know Chris personally before he, you know, became the UFC champ. And he's the same guy. He's just a hard worker. And when you're in a gym with somebody that I've known since seventh, eighth grade, and to see that, the simple equation is be the best you you can possibly be and just work as, as hard as you can and outwork everybody. So he laid the footprint. So training with a guy like that, having, you know, Ray, you know, Matt, you know, Al, a whole bunch of UFC fighters in the gym, it's like the blueprint is right there, you know. If if I don't listen to take their advice and take all the trainers' advice, I'm stupid <laughs> because Ray trained two world champions at the highest level of mixed martial arts. So he obviously knows what he's doing. So, for me, when I go into the octagon against whoever I'm, 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 I'm facing across, I know that they're not training with the world champion every single day. So, that gives me a huge mental edge. And it just know, I just know that I'm prepared for anything that, that's going to you know, happen. You know, I, I have to ask this question just for my personal knowledge. Are, are Matt Serra and Ray Longo as intense in training as they are when they're cornering one of their, their guys? Oh, my God. You, if, if you took a snapshot of when we're sparring and when they're cornered in the fight, you couldn't tell the difference. They, they, they are, when I say awesome, they're, like, literally, they're, they're the best that, that, that somebody could ever ask for, man. Like, you know, what you see is what you get. It's not, it's not for TV. It's not, it's not anything. It's literally, that's, that's Matt, that's Ray. There's never, never a dull moment in our gym. I always tell them we need to have some cameras rolling, man, because that's, that's like a sitcom waiting to happen. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. Now, now on to this season of The Ultimate Fighter. Uh, obviously, you, you tried out and you had that long wait like everybody else. Uh, can you describe where you were and what your emotions were like when you found out that you would be on season 19 of Tough or that you would have the opportunity to fight your way onto the season? Oh man, for me it was I, for me it's probably a lot different than, than uh, most guys, uh, because I was actually slated to be on the Tough Seventeenth uh, Saw show, and that's when they had two hundred five, one eighty five. They end up dropping, you know, two hundred five. So at that point, I was in two hundred five weight class. So they, you know, literally like a week or two before it was time to fight to get out, they called me up and said, you know, they're moving in a different direction. It's not really my best, their, their best interest if I don't make weight. I've never fought 185 before, so there was just too much too much risk for the for, for the USC, which I completely you know agree with. So I was like down in the dumps, dude. I'm talking about from having the highest hopes to being down and out, and literally I was like, man, maybe it's just not meant to be. Like, you know, it is what it is. And at that point, I was like, I'm just gonna have to fight my way, you know, into the USC. Got a couple fights. At that point, I was losing weight, so I was like, you know, let me try 8185. And sure enough. Season 19 came up. I didn't even know about it. My my teammate Al Alpha, who was on the live season, a finalist as well, he called me up and he was like, "Yo, dude, they're doing it again. You gotta figure it out there some way somehow." At that point, it was like a day's notice, and I was like, "Oh my god, dude, I got kids. I can't just pack up and leave." I think tryouts were in Indianapolis at that time. So sure enough, like I was so far in the process. The last time, I had all the producers. I had everybody's contact information. So I started harassing everybody who I had in my phone book. I uh, gave them a call. I, you know, I let them know the situation. Um, luckily enough, they remember me from, from trying out in season 17. They knew it was like a weight issue. Um, at that point, they, they flew me out, uh, did my medicals again. And then I was like the little waiting, the waiting game. And when they called me a few weeks, they said, listen, flying you out to fight to get in the house. I was ecstatic. I was like, listen, everything happens for a reason. I'm going to make the most of this opportunity. And uh, I was, words can't even explain. At that point, it was like final relief to get that final call, 
that they email you, give you your, your plane ticket date, your time, when to show up. That's when it became real because I already heard already from season 17, okay, we like you, you're going to be on the show, you know, hold on for our phone call. So when that phone call came, I was like, that's it. My mind was set that anything besides first place would be a disappointment for me. You know, I think that's my favorite part of the interviews with, uh, you know, guys from Tough is is finding out exactly how you felt when when you got that phone call and where you were and how nervous you were. And, I mean, it's just an amazing thing to hear. Now, you, you defeated Matt Gable by unanimous decision in your fight to get into the house. At what, at what point after that did it dawn on you that you were, you were one step closer to winning the season? Oh, my. Once they raised my hand, man, like, my goal was to get in the house, you know, take advantage of every situation possible, get better as a fighter, you know, make an impact. And you can't do that if you don't win that first fight. You know, all your hopes and dreams, nothing, nothing, you know, comes to fruition without winning that house, that fight to get in the house. So going into it, you know, 31 guys, if you ask them, every single one of them thought without a doubt in their mind they were going to be the ultimate fighter champion. So it was... um a huge accomplishment just to get through that field because realistically, I think it's in my eyes, um, obviously I'm biased, but it's the toughest fight style tournament that there is without a doubt, because guys are fighting three, four times within five weeks. Some guys don't fight that, that many fights in a year, let alone in a five week period. So, um, getting in the house was, was a huge. And from that, I said, I'm going to take this and make the most of it. Now, you said that's the toughest tournament, so all I got to add to that is take that better tour. It is the toughest tournament. <laughs> oh, without a doubt. It's like the better tour tournament, think about it. Like, that, that, a guy will fight to have two, three months off before he fights again. With the, the, the Ultimate Fighter House, you fight to get in the house, you can fight three days after that. <laughs> One, if you win that yeah. fight, you can fight another week after that. So it's literally, it's not even, it's not even, it's not even a question. Make him wait three times in a five-week period, especially for me. I love my food. That in itself is a friggin' fight. So so that's like, that's wild. <laughs> uh, yeah, I hear you on that one now. Uh, first off, um, before I ask this next question, uh, congratulations on making it to the final sets. I mean, that's a huge accomplishment. Congratulations. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Uh, now, you, to get there, you defeated two preseason favorites in Mike King and Cathal Pendred in back-to-back -back fights, no less. Uh, how difficult would you say that the road to the finals has been? Um, for me, man, I'm happy with the way it played out. Like, I got to fight, in my eyes, you know, uh, some of the toughest competition in the house, without a doubt. You know, Mike King was just as big as me, physical, strong, athletic guy, and he was, you know, the number one pick for them. So, for me, it was like, it couldn't be any better way, because I don't want to fight guys that I feel like I'm better than, and and get the easy, you know, route, you know, to the finals. I want to fight the biggest names, the best guys, not just, you know, to, to move on with the tournament, but to also test myself. Because I feel like for you to be the best, you have to beat the best. And I think that Cathal and uh, Mike were, were definitely uh, the toughest competition um, on the show, uh, especially on, on BJ's team. Um, they had tough guys all around, man. Uh, Tim Williams was another tough guy. So, I'm I'm happy the way it played out, especially, you know, finding Cathol who had the biggest name probably going into the house. More importantly is that, I mean, given the fact that your road was arguably the toughest, has been the toughest thus far, you know, winning the whole thing would just cap off an unbelievable journey. I mean, not cap off the journey, obviously, you're going to keep going, but it would cap off that particular chapter in your life. Oh, 100%. Without a doubt, like, I know this fight coming up in the finals is definitely not going to be an easy fight by any stretch. I just feel like I'm mentally prepared. I've been through the wars, and I'm just ready for literally anything. Um, you know, whoever I'm fighting, because it's not, you know, disclosed yet, you know, I know one thing for a fact is that they're not training with uh, Chris Weidman, who's fighting Leo Machida the night before. And that intensity that we go and practice, um, and not only, you know, Chris, but I, I'm lucky enough where I get to train with the guys that come down to the gym with him, I inspire with them. So uh, it's just the, the kind of preparation I got for it, it just got me, you know, mentally, you know, through the roof excited, man, just to be able to go on the octagon and showcase who I am as a fighter because 
you know, I love the, the tough tournament, the tough style, but it's a grind, man. And people don't realize it, that it just literally wears on your body mentally, physically, every way possible. So it's easier, you know, said than done. But I'm just excited to be able to go out there, let it rip, and give the fans one hell of a fight. I hear you. And now, Matt, Matt Serra won season four of The Ultimate Fighter, and here you are, one fight away from winning season 19. What would it mean to you to follow in Matt Serra's footsteps and win The Ultimate Fighter? It's huge, man. Like, I looked up to Matt Serra because he's a, he's a Long Island guy. You know, before I started, you know, indulging into uh, mixed martial arts, everybody knew who Matt Serra was. He beat GSP, who was, like, unbeatable. Like, I think GSP owes Matt a percentage of the check because <laughs> after that fight, it changed GSP's whole outlook. Like, literally, you know, he went from being a stand-up guy to, he said, you know what, these guys hit pretty damn hard. Let me figure out a way, you know, to take my training and fighting to another level. So without Matt knocking him out, I think, you know, we wouldn't even be talking about GSP on that kind of level. So he owes Matt a lot. <laughs> but looking up to, to what he did, and just being the underdog, man, that's just the mentality that I went into every single fight with, you know, because I was fortunate enough before I left, I was able to talk to Matt. I was able to pick his brain, see exactly, you know, what was going through his head during, through his head during that whole you know, time period. And then Ally Clinton, who by far had the toughest season in tough history. I don't care what anybody says, but for that dude to fight five times in 13 weeks is unreal. Just to be on a desert island, secluded from your family, friends, for 13 weeks is uh, a task in itself. So all those guys on that season are just warriors, man. I started to go friggin' crazy after a couple weeks, let alone 13. But having all those resources available um, was just priceless, man. And, and I just want to be the next ultimate fighter coming out of my gym, and I don't want to be the last because we got a lot of stud young guys coming up too, man. So I'm excited. I gotta be honest. It's good to see. I know you were you weren't born in New York, but I know that you know it's been your home for so long. So it's good to see the New York boys represent. No oh, man, I appreciate it, man. But listen, New York. I don't think we get enough credit on the East Coast. You know, for our fighting, you always hear about you know Mexico, Vegas, but uh, we're making some noise out here, man. You got Ryan LaFleur out here, Dennis Bermudez, you know, Vlante. Dude, we got Acosta Filippo. Like we got a lot of dudes within a, a five ten mile radius that is making a lot of noise in the UFC. Um, Aljamain Sterling, who's about to fight in July, Al making a noise. You know, he was a finalist on the tough show. Obviously, you know, Weidman's a chance. It's just, I don't think we get enough credit that we deserve, but, you know, we're not shy. Uh, we just got to fight for everything that, you know, we get and deserve. You know, and that's what makes it ridiculous that, you know, pro MMA is not sanctioned in New York. And, and one guy you left oh, off is also is John Jones. He's from New York. So you got two yeah, you're right. major world champions, Weidman and Jones, that, that are from New York, born and raised. That can't fight you know, in their state. Exactly, exactly. That, it's it's you know, absurd. It's like, to me, what the most frustrating part about that is that if you don't know about the sport, then you can have all the assumptions. But if anybody do any research, it's one of the safest sports to play. It's the most regulated. And more importantly, it's like, you mean to tell me if you box is legal, wrestling is legal, jiu-jitsu is legal, but if you throw it all together, it's illegal. It's like a pizza. Bread and cheese, you can't put it together. God forbid you put some pepperoni on that pizza. It's illegal. It's dangerous. <laughs> like, it's like, come on. Let's be serious. It's just nuts. It's, it's to the point where politics is getting involved with, with sports, which, which unfortunately is the case at this point. And it's just sad, man, to have two champions that can't fight in their home state and to have a guy like Matt Serra who's, poured his heart out, you know, to the to mixed martial arts. Guy has, you know, three schools and couldn't fight in front of all of his students. That's just, to me, that's wild. It's a, it's a travesty. Yeah, he, and it's, well, you're missing the part of you can't even smoke a cigarette in a bar. And, and the funny thing, Eddie, is that the guy who outlawed, who banned it, who led the ban, it was George Pataki. He's been gone for a long time in New York politics. Wow. It's wild. It's it just it's just to me it's just it's a matter of time. It's like come on, dude. It's legal in forty eight other states. Like it's it's absurd at this point. If that's the case, then and I'm a football player by heart. If you look at the not even not even numbers percentage wise, or even like head injuries or boxing, 
It is unreal. If you get a concussion, you are done. Minimum 30 days. That's the minimum before you see a doctor. In football, you get a concussion, you're playing two weeks down the road. Because you missed 30 days, you're missing four or five games. That's not happening. Like, it's literally the safest sport. As it, it, to me, it's doing more harm not being sanctioned in New York because you have all these underground fighters and all this other craziness going on. That So if they're, they're looking for safety, just regulate it, and it'll be that much better for everybody. It, it's great that you say that because if you look at the concussion protocols in football, basketball, and MMA, and MMA is safer because obviously it's safe to assume that when you suffer a knockout loss, you probably suffered a concussion. It might be slight. It might be a big concussion. It's safe to assume that. And it's handled as such. But in football, I can't tell you the amount of times I've seen a guy say, yeah, I'm okay, I'm okay. And he's clearly, you know, seeing stars, you know, like the cartoon. Oh, guy. yeah, without a doubt. So 100%. Crazy. And you're not, you're not playing 16 games in 16 weeks. You know, you're fighting, you know, most guys fight every, you know, two, three months the earliest, you know. So you give your body time to recuperate, you can rest your injuries, and then jump into a six- to eight-week camp. So it's like it's it's so regulated, it's safe, but just politics, man. It's, it's, to me, it's the lawless thing. Politics shouldn't be involved in sports or kids. <laughs> that's just my, that's just my view. Yeah, you know, it's funny. They can't even run the government, but they want to regulate sports. It's, it's wild, man. It's like focus on one thing. <laughs> And plus, New York needs the money. We're complaining about how much money we need. They keep raising the prices on, on, on subways and buses and tickets and all that stuff. A, a UFC event will bring in anywhere from 10 to 11 million bucks easily from restaurants, from, you know, small mom and pops, um, hotels, the venue itself, tax money on that, transportation. It's it's a no-brainer. It, to me, it's just wild. It makes no sense. Well, to, to be honest, Eddie, uh, I actually I've lived in South Florida the last six years. Uh, I was born okay. and raised in New York. That's where my heart is always at. But to be honest, like, I moved down here because I just couldn't make it there. Like, I, I mean, you could relate. I mean, like, you go to a, a place, you know, maybe uptown New York or whatever, and you have this little one-bedroom apartment, and you're probably paying, like, $1,300 a month for it. Oh, man, it's it's crazy. Like, it's wild. Being on the show... I was able to talk to other guys and see, like, what their living expense was. Um, I can't remember. I think Diego Lima, he, he was, what, in Atlanta. He told me he had a three-, four-bedroom house. His mortgage was $600. I said, dude, oh, that's, my like, my utility bills. <laughs> I'm talking about, like, my house is the – I'm like, I wish. If my mortgage was $600, I would be on, like, forget, like, I'll be, I'll be smiling from ear to ear. That's, like, the utilities <laughs> in New York. It's just, it's just wild, man. Yeah, you know, here I was. I was going to brag about paying $655 a month for a one-bedroom apartment that's pretty d- a nice size. You know, and this be- this apartment in New York would go for like $1,400 a month. Oh, it's nuts. It's wild. I, I completely I, – I, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. But uh, one one last question on Tuff. Uh, how, how would you describe your overall experience? Oh, it was priceless, man. I, I literally couldn't ask for a better experience, you know, falling on, you know, BJ Penn's team, I'm sorry, uh, being on Frank Edgar's team, uh, going against BJ Penn, who was a legend, who I looked up to, and it was just, I couldn't ask for a better bunch of guys to spend, you know, six weeks with. Uh, both teams were respectable, you know, despite all you see on TV, <laughs> we uh, end up, you know, leaving on a good note. Uh, to this day, I still speak, you know, to a lot of guys on the blue team. I talk to all the guys on the red team. Like, we're, we literally created a bond that is literally going to be unbelievable. Uh, you know, talking to these guys, we text back and forth, you know, all of us. Uh, it was just priceless. If there's anything I would possibly change, it's nothing with the show. It'll probably be my own personal decision to, to probably, I would have fought a weight class up because the, uh, the grind that it took on my body to make weight three times in five weeks. I would never wish that on anybody. <laughs> um, that's the part of fighting that you don't really see, you don't really hear about, but, you know, it takes a lot of focus and to maintain that weight and rehydrate. I think it was just a lot, you know, to go through for such a short period of time, so many times. So I would definitely, you know, sort up in the weight class without a doubt. 
Well, I'll tell you what. Other than that, that everything last, was priceless. Definitely, and I, at least you guys all made weight. Last season, we had two guys, you know, be cut because they couldn't make weight. And to uh, me, that that's the craziest thing that could possibly have. That's just not makes no sense. You're in the biggest opportunity of your life. They give you every chance, every opportunity. They sink down to a science. <laughs> like that's just wild. I can't even believe that. If you can make the way to get into the house, it falls on you at that point. That just means that you know, how in between fights, you're just out eating, getting fat. You know, you know what's uh, funny, Eddie. Uh, and and before I let you go, um, it's funny because I I had the the you know the honor of interviewing those guys. I say it's an honor. It's an honor to interview have to have a few minutes of anybody's time. You know, but um, I talked to out. these guys, and and it's funny because it it was before that episode aired where they both missed weight. I mean, they one missed weight uh, the first episode and the next one the following week. Uh, and they're here talking straight face, and I'm here praising them and saying how they're good and everything. And then the next thing you know, that happens, and I'm like, wow, I just, you know, I'm here, like, giving you compliments, and we're having great conversations. And the whole time it was like, I, you know, I understand they couldn't reveal it. I understand that part, but it was so, like, awkward in hindsight to think about that stuff. Yeah, it's, it's 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 wild, man. It's just something that's very unfortunate. Like literally, the thing that got me because I couldn't even watch that season because we were, it was being they were airing it while we were in the house. But when I watched it, it's like he didn't even give himself an opportunity to make weight. Like he just literally just like quit and packed his bag up. Like if you try to the end and you don't make weight and your body just shuts down, you know, all right, man, you gave it your all. <laughs> But if you used to say, if you could say physically, yeah, I'm done, then yeah, you're not done. <laughs> That's just the way I, I look at it. He had a lot left yeah, in the tank, man. Definitely a good way to look at it. Now, um, before before I let you go, where can we find you on, on Facebook and or Twitter? Yeah, man, definitely um, you know, check me out on Twitter, at Truck MMA. I always keep it very uh, entertaining on Twitter, so... You definitely won't disappoint you following me. <laughs> and uh, on Facebook, <laughs> check out my fan page, uh, Eddie Truck Gordon. Um, and all the support, man, is awesome. But listen, any haters out there, I'm more than happy to have you follow me and talk trash to me, too. That's fine. You know, <laughs> I'm all about it. <laughs> it's always fun and games, you know. It's um, The biggest difference between, I think, MMA and every other professional sport is the interaction between, you know, the athletes and the actual fans. No, it's about the fans. Whether they like us, hate us, whatever it may be, it's huge that they're 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 a part of the sport because if they know half of these fighters, I'm sure they're gonna like us anyway because we're just people like them. But it keeps the sport interesting and fun, man. So uh, by all means, guys, definitely check me out on Twitter at truckmma.com. Look at my dot com and everything. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we'll definitely get that out there. And um, Eddie, it was a tremendous honor having you on, and I really hope that I lived up to the the pre-show hype. Yo, you were definitely good, man. I'm telling you, you're talented. Uh, man, I, I, that means a lot to me. I really appreciate that, sir. Uh, thank you for having me, man. I appreciate it, man. Uh, take care. Have a good weekend, and best of luck next Sunday at the uh, finale. Awesome. Thanks. Appreciate it. Take care. Bye-bye. Have a good one.